I wish I was back in Denmark Street the way it used to be. Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very Merry Christmas to all of you today. We're very honoured and privileged to have the wonderful Spiz Energy with us. Spiz, how are you doing? Hello, I'm all right. Uh, well, I'm all right as far as one could be in these circumstances. Indeed, indeed. Yes, it's been crazy, but you've made the best of it. So Spiz has teamed up with award-winning producer Tony Visconti to release a festive protest anthem, Christmas in Denmark Street, and that's going to be out December the 18th. Is that right, Spiz? Yeah, it's not strict, strictly it's not a protest song. It's more a fact that I I knew when when the when I wrote it, it was in the last week of the 12 Bar Club, and uh, I went every night of the last week because it was it coincided with my birthday. And I knew that if I went every night, uh, there'd be plenty of people to uh, pour, pour liquor down my neck. And um, <laughs> the way, I knew about all the behind the scenes, about the developing and, and, how, and the reason why the 12 bar was closing. Uh, and I knew they weren't going to put it back. I knew the developers were going to lie because I knew some of the people, as I say, who were campaigning to keep the street saved and and soho on the other side there was two campaigns there was so, and i was just it because it, it was january the, the, the second week of january and it was just shortly after christmas and i was on the way home on my bike and i started singing a song to my i wish i was back in denmark street the way it used to be because i know it was not going to be the same and that would be just before christmas so it's not it's all it is we mentioned christmas as, as a time that it was before when the 12 bar club closed but yes, oh, I see. I'm angry. So in that much, it is a protest. But it's because I'm, I, I was passionate about. We all loved it. All those, all those in our musical scene of, of you know, all the bands that played the hundred club and and venues of that size. It was like our youth club. Some some bands would come in after they'd just done their gig at the hundred club because the hundred club closed at eleven, and we 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 were all quite chummy with each other. And we had the atmosphere was fantastic, and as I said, uh, I wish I was back in Denmark Street the way because it was not going to be like it was that that particular year yeah and definitely. now we, we come forward to now and we're not going to have a Christmas like the one we had last year <laughs> it's all so going downhill way, it's come <laughs> it's come as self-fulfilling prophecy because I wrote that five years ago nearly now and uh wow. I, I bet me and Luca we performed it as an acoustic song in the first few months of when we finished writing it my guitarist in Spears Energy Luca Comancini and we uh, we performed it, and on the first time we performed it, within the third chorus, people were singing along, and we thought, "Hello, this is something special going on here." Anyway, sorry, I'm interrupting all your questions. No, no, that's perfect. Thank you. You just steamed through the first five questions like bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to ask is that um, I've heard that the reason Denmark Street is going down is because something to do with Crossrail. Do you can you give us any information on that? Well, when the Crossrail project came up, they obviously started buying up all the properties around the stations because they're going to have to transform the stations to cope with the extra volume of p people. And it was still, it was a good idea make make Heathrow connect straight over to Canary Wharf and to the east. So it's a straight route for for business and and finance and and, and commuters and and shoppers. But uh, they didn't make any effort to uh, negotiate. They literally just told people yeah this is the money you get out and uh obviously a lot of the guitar shops felt the pressure and left there's only about half of them left the music shops and the frontages have all stayed but behind it there'll be all uh, all manner of uh, modern rubbish and the, the, the 12 bar uh uh forge they, they actually moved, removed it and they said they're going to place it back but they'll just be like a like a a, a a museum piece surrounded by glass you won't it won't be a club like the yeah. club we had there and so yeah it's crossrails caused it but also the, the the people who who benefit from from redeveloping the areas and putting up f f fancy flats and shops they're all people who already already got the biggest pockets of money in the world you know yeah yeah and it, and also like um a while ago i went to new york and i went on a tour of the old spots where like a lot of punk stuff happens so they the feel more east CBGB and yep. uh, places where Iggy Pop, the Ramones and New York Dolls used to hang around and everything's just become a bank or a shop. And it's just, it's just uh, yeah. such a shame. Yeah, that's what happened. When we were in uh, Manhattan uh, for our beginning of our American tour, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, 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 we were, that was where it was just starting this whole uh, sort of re rebuilding 
uh, social cleansing of the of the poor out of the center of the city. And and what happened in in in, in London after World War Two, because of the rubble and everyone would fled out to these satellite towns like you know, Luton, Watford, uh, uh, Ilford, and all out there. And 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 the, the city was left empty of, of with hardly uh, any uh, re renovation. And that's where squatters moved in. And then now the reverse has happened. The, the wealthy are moving back in to be closer to their opera houses and the restaurants and, and they're kicking out the poor and, mm. and the lower paid. And, and, but that's no good because in, you need, because people on lower paid are also your nurses, your firemen, and they yeah. have to live near where they work. So if you yeah. out of where they work, you, I'm sounding like a, a, an angry politician, but that's because I am angry. <laughs> yeah. And I do take an interest in politics, yes. Yeah, no, definitely, man. And you should. And it's good to talk about these things because um, we don't want to walk blindly into something that could be terrible. I mean, we need to talk about these things and bring them to light. Definitely. Um, OK, so <laughs> let's talk about Tony Visconti. <laughs> so, so Tony's worked with David Bowie for many years and he produced his last album, Black Star. He's done loads and he's 76 now. So, I mean, how was it working with him and how's he getting on? Well, the thing was with Tony is that I was in the film Breaking Glass as a, a was going to have a speaking part, but I ended up having only a, a bit part because I couldn't act at 21. I wasn't ready for it. I'd only just moved <laughs> to London. I wasn't. I, I wanted to be. Oh, I was up for the cup, but I just didn't know uh, the skills. Uh, so we got uh, non non speaking parts in the background. Uh, Hazel O'Connor's vehicle. It was really to get her, and the pro the album was produced by Tony Visconti. So. Uh, mm. the, that's when uh, we would have actually been in the same room together years ago. And then uh, obviously uh, being a big Bowie fan, and I got to uh, hang out a bit, not with Bowie, but personally, but I did some work for Bowie. And then, um, so I got started, you know, I knew people around the, uh, why well, I shared a flat with a photographer, Ray Stevenson, who, who used to hang out with Bowie and, and Tony Visconti when they were in uh, the, uh, the hype, uh, the, the Bowie's mega hype it was before you found Ziggy fan the Ziggy idea and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of on the edge of the circle of people who know Tony and then I got to Tony came through on my Facebook for a few years back and then he came to London uh, oh yeah I've, I've had a couple of photos with Tony in the past and then um, he came to do the uh, Holy Holy show at the uh, in uh, Camden's uh, roundhouse and I, I knew virtually half the band you know James Stevenson Glenn Gregory was singing and uh, a couple of other guitarists I knew and so I went to the gig and my manager my new manager went along as well Andrew and he uh got a ticket because he's in the industry and uh so we just uh, went to the VIP part afterwards and Tony came up and uh, I said oh, I tell you how you this is my manager Andrew we got this idea for a song and uh, I left it with him and then um he said yeah okay yeah send, send me uh, send me the demo see so that's all we did. We sent him the demo and he liked it. That's all we needed. And then we sent him all the files over. We didn't actually work in the same studio. We weren't in the same space. We just sent all the files in, on, on the internet to him and he mixed it and sent it back. And then there's a couple of little tweaks. He said, well, can we have a little bit more of that? And, and he, he polished it all up and it sounds fantastic. Wow. Yeah, no, definitely. No, we love the single and we're going to play it after the interview. So looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah, like I said, he's in his 70s. You've got a lot of people in the punk scene in their 70s or edging towards that. You've got Charlie Harper, yeah, yeah. the damn reforming. I've already just got in the 60s. Anyway, yeah, go on. <laughs> and uh, I was just I think Charlie's way ahead of, of most of us. <laughs> I was just going to say, do you think that when you're doing something you're really passionate about and you love, there is no retirement? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, I, I, when I started in this game, I didn't actually uh, have it as a career path. It sort of fell into my lap because of the way punk evolved while I was at college. So I, I've been going to college to do go on stage, but there was no, uh, there was no um, uh, security. You just kept doing what you did, and then, uh, you know, you didn't. I did when, when I was at school. I didn't think I'd live past forty, and then I got you get to forty and think, hang on a minute. Uh, but I've got a pension. I haven't got a pension scheme. I'm just going to have to do this until I drop, frankly. And I think there's many <laughs> the same boat. Yeah, yeah. Loads of people in the same boat, um, definitely. Um, so I wanted to ask you, because uh, I've been watching the video and I really enjoyed it. I mean, let's uh, let's talk about the video. So you're down at the Alley Cat. You're on Denmark Street, famously where uh, the, the Pistols, Led Zeppelin recorded and many other people. Yeah, well, um, obviously, uh, I say obviously, but I was... Uh, I was going to the 12 bar a lot. Uh, in fact, I, my first 
experience in Denmark Street with was buying a guitar when I, my first guitar got stolen. And then uh, mm -hmm. I got invited to do a radio session for a, a radio, a little known radio station called Resonance 104.4 FM. And they were in the building up the stairs above where number six, the Sex Pistols used to, Glenn Matlock had a, and a flat and the band used to rehearse there and Banana Rama sort of stayed there overnight for a few weeks. Uh, and they used it as a rehearsal place. And uh, all the music publishers and managers, and it was called Tim Pan Alley, because that's where for, for most of the last century, all the music industry was focused on that part of Soho. Uh, and uh, we've, lost, we've sadly lost it really, but I, um, I forgot what you were saying. What did the start of that question? <laughs> I was just asking about the music video and filming on Denmark Street oh, yeah. and the made, history for it. Video? How we made the video was that uh, um, Steve in the pub, uh, my mate Steve, he's making a film, a proper film with actors and steam trains and everything. Wow. And he, <laughs> yeah, oh, it's be, it's going to be fantastic. But it's, because it's now what's happened, it's going to have to be a mini series to get it on telly because no one's going to go to the cinema to see it. So uh, he's, so he's had to make it longer. But he, so he's moved to London to do some filming, and he came to the pub. Me and my old mate of mine, and uh, we, he said, "I could make you a video because the song was another month away from being coming out." And he said, uh, "I said, can you? All right, that was it." The, and <laughs> we did write down what, what we'll do. So right, basically, me and Steve went down Denmark Street and looked uh, looked around the street, and then they went back the following week to film it with some of the lads in the band. And guess what? Uh, the, the, the Camden were resurfacing the road and had blocked all the road off. So there was no traffic. We had the road to ourselves. So we just picked our place and did our bit. Uh, it was all, <laughs> we had to make an arrangement with Regent Sounds to do a bit in their shop. And they were more than helpful as long as we did it in the morning at 11 o'clock on a Saturday. So that was brilliant. Yeah. And then we did extra shots around Soho just to get a, a, a variation of scenery. And it was a sim, there was no big long, uh, paperwork of uh, a treatment they call it in the movies and the cinema and theatre and video there's no treatment we we literally saw the space and made the shapes what we wanted and it's come we've had very really good uh, very really good responses saying it's a great video which is very kind of everyone but uh, we, well thank you very much it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's, it's brilliant and um so the campaign to save the venue supported by the who the kinks uh, soft cell the uh, the 12 bar club and um, the, the venue's been host to Jeff Buckley, Adele, the Libertines, and loads and loads of other bands. I mean, how yeah. can listeners save the 12 bar? Is there anything the listeners can well, they're do gonna, to help? They're going to make a, a venue there, but it will be just like lots of uh, big video screens and a big square glass box. It, it won't be like a club, like you liked it. You know, it won't yeah. be you know, the whole char charm. And I was horrified when I first went to the 12 bar. I thought, what, what, what? But then it's the people that make a venue, not 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 the actual, you know, the steps and the carpet and the walls, and it's it's the people that go there, and that's what yeah. they've lost. That's what they've never come back. I mean, all those people you just mentioned, that that was for a campaign for for Sa Save Soho, and and the, the Denmark Street was a separate campaign because they're in different boroughs. One's in Westminster, one's in Camden. That mm. sort of diffused the uh, whole thing but the, yeah they got on board there's, uh, there's footage there's a, a filmmaker uh, Tales of Tim Pan Alley done by uh, Henry Scott Irving and you can see uh, he, he's interviewed Kenny Jones he's got loads of big names in his film but that's all been in the can for some time it's too late we really have lost lost Denmark Street uh, the you know the alley cat has claimed they're going to open again uh, I, I spoke to Regent Sounds while we were filming and they said I said they said they're going to open it again but of course that was September. Now we know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, are we, what are we talking about. You know, who, who, what else is it going to be used for? Who's going to, what, what can it be used for? This is the, all the dilemmas we're all facing of the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it is crazy. All right, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a sweep back now um, to your early career. So, I mean, you went along to a Susie Nabanchi's gig at the Barbarellas in Birmingham. Um, tell us about what happened that night that changed your life. Well, that, you see, is the uh, classic uh, Wikipedia errors that you were reading. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> is, uh, and, and I mischievously don't bother to correct them. I leave, <laughs> I leave these, these, these errors up there. But that gives me an opportunity to put you straight. What is happened is that <laughs> Go for it. In, in, in Birmingham in, in 1977, uh, I, you know, I was into the punk scene. I was going to a few gigs. 
And it wasn't till I saw The Clash, July 1977 at Barbarella's in Birmingham, which was the night spot for all the punk bands because they realised this is getting the people in. And uh, a month later, I, I was actually doing myself. I thought, I could, this is it, I can do this. And there was a punk festival on August the 29th at 1977 at Barbarella's, an all-day weekender. And I, managed, I knew a band that was playing and I, I persuaded them to let me borrow the guitar and I'll go straight on. But I still had to get the permission from the promoter. So I cajoled him, I harangued him until he basically put me on to get rid of me. And I got on stage and I was terrible, but I was also audacious. And in those equal <laughs> measures, won the crowd over because they'd got a bit bored during the afternoon of some of these same-o, same-o punk bands. And I won the crowd, a bit like a gladiator, win the crowd. And, uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I was off and running and then I got a couple of other gigs and one of them was supporting Susie the Banshees and that's where the ch everything changed again and the, the, the Banshees liked me and the manager of, uh, of the club that are playing decided to be my manager and then we started doing gigs with Susie. I did uh, nearly all their support slots for 1978 because we, we did the tour as well, the Scream tour in 1978. So I went from being that, from that, that cheeky moment on stage to then doing a few gigs in Birmingham on beer crates with my mate Pete on guitar because I couldn't do both sing and play guitar and, and, and sustain it on my own. So um, we became a duo and then we called ourselves Spiz Oil and that's how the ball rolled and then we got the pivotal gig playing at the Roundhouse again on July 23rd, 1978 where, where we, we, turned the, we won the crowd again where we had some <laughs> We had 200 hostile skinheads at the front, but we won the crowd at the back and got an encore. And we got from that, we got the John Peel session. And from that, we got the Rough Trade release. And then, and then it's wow. all there for fine. <laughs> Excellent. What was it like when um, John Peel said kind words about your music? Well, that's it. I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, when, when, when the announcement that uh, on tonight's John Peel show, hearing my name for the first time on the radio, I was, we were actually looking for a dog, a friend's dog on the coast. <laughs> his dog had run off him so I couldn't really enjoy it because there was all this stress going on from, <laughs> from, uh, but I, I you know I obviously taped it on, on a little one of those little recorders uh you know the little disc dance set they were little yeah size, yeah like the size of a house brick and um recorded and got yeah so hearing his voice say my name was quite special yeah yeah excellent it was a good thing you taped it then <laughs> so you mean you mentioned touring a lot with Susie and the Banshees I mean what was that like and how did you get on with those guys well we felt terrific because you know I was reading the music papers from 1973 so to see a band like Susie getting great reviews for being the Ice Queen and different from slightly edgier <laughs> punk, more you know they, they, they started to sound a bit different from punk you know, it possibly started the post-punk vibe, and uh, we were we were cool because we were on the same show with them, and and it was great. And it's, it's Susie the Benchy, Spit Oil, and Human League. You know, we were, we were in the yeah. sandwich. It was it was terrific fun. It was it was scary as well because some of those gigs there, like Bristol, was particularly memorable because of um, uh, the both teams had played at home. Bristol Rovers of Bristol City, I think they're called, and they they all were wearing their scarves. So they're half the half was blue and white half was red and white and they just just kicked off it was like mayhem it was terrible wow <laughs> wow 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 <laughs> yeah that must have been mad it was a violent time uh yeah a lot of craziness you had to on. look over one shoulder for the police you had to look the other shoulder <laughs> the skinheads. and then you had to people just didn't like the look of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think my dad said he remembers riding his bike to work clocking somebody and thinking oh no i'm gonna have to have a fight i've got to keep keep myself together before work <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it was there. There was good. well. I, don't, I think uh, I think we're in danger of getting to to uh, unpleasantness on the streets again with this uh, the, the the variations of of lockdown versus masks versus versus the uh, the racial tensions again uh, yeah. risen, risen through this government's inability to govern fairly. Oh yeah, totally. I think it makes a huge, Back up huge difference. Box. When you have like terrible leadership, then it does make a big difference. I think when they have, when Boris goes on TV and he's got a chance to speak to the country, like, I mean, he has like a bumbling effect. He's not speaking <laughs> to the country, he's five of his wealthy mates. We're, 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 we're nothing. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. I mean, it would make a big difference if he talked a bit more about unity and love than if he just, uh, Told a load of lies. And going, it's going to be fine when we all know it's not. <laughs> That's why they got in because they didn't do that. They they, they were deliberately fueled like Trump did in the USA, fueled the uh, the lowest common denominator to come to the front. 
<laughs> so you yeah. Never over. You, 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 so you keep. You think you've won the battle in the seventies with rock against racism. You think you've won these battles, and you haven't. They, they just. It's just like a tie. They go in, they come out. They go in, and they've come in again. And we, we've got to fight again. Yeah, definitely. Keep fighting. So, what was it like when you were a teenager and punk first came into your life? And that, I mean, you must have, in your spirit, been quite like a conscientious person and somebody who was um, thinking like, "This isn't right. We got to do something here." <laughs> Well, for me, the, the thing was that I was already quite, uh, uh, I, I was already out there because before punk happened, I was into uh, the, the, the weird end of glam rock, you know, Alice Cooper, David Bowie, and yeah. uh, uh, not, not Slade or, 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 you know, Mud or whoever, gl Glitter, you know, I was into uh, the art house uh, stuff. So I, that's why I went to art college, because uh, basically my parents said to my eldest brother, you know, you've got to get a proper job, sensible job. You get and get a proper apprentice. So he got bullied into going to get a, a proper job in apprenticeship and stuff. Then my middle brother sort of didn't know what to do, but he, he was tall. And so he went and joined the police force. <laughs> I know. And then uh, and then it sort of got around to me thinking, oh, well, he's, he likes drawing. He, I was always drawing on the telly with my headphones on, listening to music because well, you know, I didn't want to watch uh, Saturday seaside saturday uh, under the tent with all the uh, terrible uh, acts that they used to have on there like, like the black and white minstrels so i had my headphones on trying to shut myself away and then i went to art school where and of course i was reading all the music papers and then i saw these stories about bands with interesting names like sex pistols stinky toys you know the <laughs> damn the, dam, the clash these aren't these are, these are different names that are coming yeah. out of london and so i was ready i was ready to be uh, plucked by the <laughs> The clash sort of um, moved moved us all towards the left a bit, and I, that was welcome. Uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. So at the time, were your parents supportive of what you were doing? Were they worried? Were they music fans at all? Yeah, no, they were they were supportive in as much as long as I didn't uh, play my records loudly while they were in the house. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. then they, did, they did. My dad did drive my big painting strapped to the roof of the car to, all the way to Bath for my uh, my interview to continue my art course which I then flunked so I wasn't popular in that department uh, for a while <laughs> uh, but you know uh, and I got into trouble a bit I was I was a naughty one in the family uh, couldn't help myself I was just create it was creativity going wrong really <laughs> yeah I, you're I, like I'm, I'm here I've arrived I didn't mean to set fire to that field it, it, <laughs> the fire came and put it out you know <laughs> so I mean tell me a bit about when you met the guitarist Pete Petrol and you started penning songs. Well, I was at school with Pete, um, and we were in the woodwork class. Uh, there was another guitarist who was next to me, uh, uh, whose surname is Rose. What was it? N Nigel Rose. And then uh, there was uh, P Pete Davis. He had a guitar, and Pete had a bass guitar, and Rob Wetton had a drum kit. So we started uh, going around at his house and all playing a couple of cover versions because we didn't think we could write songs and then at, at school we were also allowed to uh, uh during dinner time we, we we opened up the science uh, room and plugged in amplifiers and and we used to play in 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 the science lab at lunchtime and all the other kids came around and watched and and at the end of school disco we did a we did a little set and during, in, well everyone just sat around waiting for the disco to start again but while we did our we really did our <laughs> antics, but I was already wearing makeup then. I was wearing makeup like because I was Alice Cooper, right? I put a bit of Alice Cooper type makeup on, and I had my yeah. shirt, all, my school shirt, all ripped up, you know, torn up. So it's punky then, and that was a year before punk in London. So it's seventy five. That was, I think. And uh, yeah. so uh, uh, then I didn't see Pete after school for two years, and it, it was after my parents had forced me to get a job uh, because I wasn't doing anything after I'd flunked college and I bumped into Pete on the street and I had this gig at the Vortex in London and I didn't know how to get there and I'd already said yeah I'll go and do it but I, I was still working out how I was going to get there and Pete drove past in his banged up old Anglia and beep beep and we went for a beer and I said I've got this gig in London dear, and you've got a car uh, and you've got a guitar so we wrote four songs in the evening that evening in his bed sit and then worked out a couple of cover versions one being a Bowie song Hang On To Yourself and uh, we, we just drove down to London and then we to our horror, found out we weren't going to get paid. We were just adding to the bill by the guy who put one of his bands on. It was the Killjoys, I think, and uh, Model Mania and us. And uh, we went there. And so I just used my uh, heaviest of heavy. Uh, it wasn't very tall and all, all heavy, but I was taller than <laughs> And I, I, I bludgeoned him into, uh, oi, you know, 
come down from Birmingham. We, we've got to get petrol and we've got to feed ourselves on the motorway. So I've got <laughs> 25 quid out of him. <laughs> so, oh, well done. <laughs> uh, so we had, sausage, we had sausages on the motorway and, uh, <laughs> and, and filled the car with petrol. That's yes, what you've got to do, isn't it? You've got, uh, you got to hassle these promoters when they try to rip you off. It's not, it's not fair. They still do it to this day. And uh, I mean, I've well, been yeah, in... Well, yeah, admit, we only got 20, 25 quid for most of that year. That was the most... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember I was out in Croatia and I DJed for like five hours and the guy oh, was right, like... Croatia. All right, we better ring the bell for that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the guy was like, oh, I didn't like it. I was like, well... You could come up to me 40 minutes in and say it, you didn't like it then. Why'd you let me go for five hours? I was like, he was like, I don't want to pay you. I was like, well, you're going to pay me because I've played for five hours. So, you know, everyone's dancing, like just making some mad excuse up just to get out of like 60 euros or something stupid. It's like, come on, mate. <laughs> yeah, you got to be firm. <laughs> That's that yeah, you got to stick up for yourself. No one else will. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, Palmer Live from the Slits was briefly in the band. What happened there? Well, what happened was we're, do we're doing the tour with Susie and we, we thought, our manager thought, you know, we we're going to be playing Hammersmith, Hammersmith Odeon. So we've gone from playing in beer crates in Birmingham to Hammersmith Odeon in 10 months. And so we thought, well, where can we beef up? What do, you know, Palmer Live's just been kicked out of the Slits or left the Slits. Uh, and we, I, I'd actually met a couple of the Slits before, uh, seen them at gigs and that. And... Um, uh, uh, so Palm Olive was up for it. She said, "Yeah." So we, we we did a couple of rehearsals and we did three shows with the with the Hammersmith one in the middle uh, to make it more um, you know a bit more oomph. Yeah. And that, then she moved back to America and now she's gone back to religion. She's quite quite Catholic again now. She was from uh, she was a Catholic uh, Portuguese girl, I think. Okay. She used to go she used to go out with she went out with Joe Strummer for a period. She was Joe's Joe's thing for a while. Oh, all right. There you go. Oh, yeah. Fame to fame. Right. <laughs> Ring the bell for that one, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about the name changes. So there was Spiz Oil, Spiz Energy, the Spizzles, Spiz 80. There's Af Atletico Spiz 80. And you got even... them in the right order, yeah. Yeah, there was even like a... Um, a possibility of Guinness Book of Records for... So tell me all about this whole... Well, what, your name. It's quite an organic thing. I, I was I decided, you know, in 77, I'm going to be speed 77. And it looked good on little design I made up from a bag. And then uh, when 70, Pete joined, and now it was an evolution. And, and he was calling himself Pete Plectrum. But then I saw the oil rigs at Christmas being turned on by the Queen and, and Tony Ben. And I thought, Spears Oil. It's symmetrical design-wise. It's brilliant. I love it. So <laughs> I persuaded Pete to become Pete Petrol. Brilliant, fantastic, great idea. So then uh, we did that all that touring and then Susie, but then me and Pete sort of started having a bit of friction and fell out a bit at the end of 1978. Yeah. And so uh, I, I, my girlfriend at the time, she, she introduced me to some musicians that were looking for a certain singer, you know, because they had keyboard and piano and guitar. A bass and guitar and so um they came around the and we did a we did a sort of jam thing and I, I said do you know how to play Virginia Plain that's one of my favorite songs so they played Virginia Plain got a piano so it worked and um but their guitarist was it didn't work out so we didn't that he didn't play beyond that rehearsal and so he started looking for the guitarist but I didn't want people thinking they were coming to see Spears Oil I wanted them to see this, this is a new setup now it's Spiz Energy. And as it happened, Pete Petrol did rejoin us for the Rough Trade Tour in May. So Spiz Energy, we, we, we did a radio, oh yeah, we had, we got radio, another radio session with John Peel, but we didn't have any new songs. So we wrote them there and then and went, and went straight down and, and did them. So Soldier Soldier is literally a week old when we played it on the John Peel session in March 1979. And then we had seven guitarists in 1979, five drummers. So by the time we got to the end, we thought, well, let's, Let's change the name again. We've got a different band virtually now. And that's how it evolved, it kept evolving. We chose Atletico Spizzetti because of the Olympic Games in Moscow and how Thatcher and Reagan were, 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 were piling on the pressure for athletes not to go. But athletes only have a short window where they are good at doing what they do. Yeah. And if you miss one Olympic Games, you might not be good enough for the next one at all, mm. ever. And is it so we thought Atletico Spizzetti with the runner logo on our logo. And so that's... Um, that, that, that works. And then we, the manager thought we were going to be as big as the Beatles. So he sort of foisted the name Spizzles on us. So uh, the name is crap. But the album was all right. And then um, 
And then I fell out with the whole lot and I went solo and called myself Spiz Orwell a year before 1984, thinking that was clever. But no, it was too clever because it's a year too early. So <laughs> then I kept changing the name. And by the time I got to um, the 12th name, someone said, Spiz, you, you should write to the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, I'm sure you could get in the record books with that. It'd be good, you know. You, you've 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 probably had more bands than anybody else named after you or, or or made more records under different names than anyone on earth so i said yeah yeah right so i wrote a letter and i got a letter back from the uh, deputy editor sheila thomas and she said it's too specialized to be in a guinness book of records i said specialized <laughs> I say that to her she, but then she put in the bottom of the letter by the way i bought where's captain kirk well, i thought that would be in it <laughs> She's a fan. <laughs> so, that was, that was That's why I remember everything about that letter. And then, so yeah, so they're specialised. There's people have sawn a motorbike up and eaten it. How more specialised can you get? <laughs> so, so that's it. I thought I'm not going to change my name anymore. But what I have done, I have done, because I had a record out on the damaged goods called uh, a flexi disc uh, uh, they released, which was uh, Spismus. So that was a Christmas record. And then they did, uh, I've, in Italy, I've got some friends in Milan who learn my songs and I just fly out and then we do a couple of shows as Spiz Italia. And so I can rebrand whatever I'm doing. Well, now the internet's here, but what happened back in 1980, we'd turn up at a venue and they still had Spiz Energy on the poster because uh, they didn't get the memo and the printers. <laughs> and so, yeah. but now the internet's caught up. I could. Then finally, the world has caught up with me only 40 years late. But, you know, um, that's the trouble when you're ahead of your time. It's always a trouble. <laughs> it's not easy to keep up with all of these crazy name changes. But the world's finally caught up, so that's good. So, yeah, I had a similar thing with the Guinness Book of Records because I, I broadcast this radio show from 14 different countries. And I was just like, surely that's the most miles traveled by a single radio show. And they said the same thing. They were like, that's too specialized. I'm like, well, anyone could buy a plane ticket, you know, like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where their heads at. I suppose it's just whatever floats their boat. I mean, yeah, sitting in a, uh, the most baked, most tight days in a bath of baked beans. What's that about? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's not, that's not, anyone, any idiot can do that. But you could try writing songs for umpteen named bands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So back in the day, Where's Captain Kirk was released on Rough Trade Records in 1979 and spent seven weeks at the top of the indie chart, which was a brand new chart at the time. Can you tell me about that, that time? Well, what happened was, yeah, we actually released it in December and had the chart been in existence, we would have been at number one at Christmas uh, <laughs> uh, with Where's Captain Kirk. But the chart was uh, uh, basically all the uh, independent record labels got together well, not all of them, but a handful, led by Ian McNay of Cherry Red. And they got together to put to uh, put it to the BMRB, who make the main charts, to say, look, we've got all these record shops that you are missing out on collating, that are selling quite a lot of records, you know, Stiff Little Fingers were selling bucket loads. And uh, and you're, you're not, they're being missed out on the chart. So then they agreed to create this official independent record labels chart, which only sourced stores like, you know, Joe's records in Newcastle or Fred's records in Bristol and yeah. so all these record shops all around the country were piling sending in their chart chart returns best sales for the week and we were number one instantly at the first week of January the 19th 1980. Yeah amazing. I stayed in the chart for the whole year. <laughs> That's incredible because I mean I I studied like a lot of music um through my life I've done lectures and stuff like that and I met this guy who was like really clued up on independent record sales and stores from back in the day and he was saying that Woolworths got a better deal than the indie independent record stores so what the indies would do was go to Woolworths buy up all the David Bowie and sell it again so a lot of these big numbers we've got from back in those times for the big artists they're actually double sales so yes. it's good that they had an indie chart because they were much fairer you know yeah yeah more realistic uh gauge of what's going on but the, yeah. the, the, those record stores that I was mentioning, the uh, little independent, they were actually sending in, or, or, or certainly Sounds and uh, Record en Enemy were, were ringing up those stores ra randomly and asking for a list of songs that they've sold the most of. And the chart wasn't that much different in the last couple of weeks leading up to the official chart anyway, except we didn't get our position as an official number one at Christmas. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's why I keep re releasing the Christmas records. No, actually, as, as I say, 
Denmark Street isn't a Christmas song. Did I tell you that? It's not a protest song. It's not a Christmas song. Is it? <laughs> yeah, just mention, just to mention two Christmas. Things. Yeah. <laughs> so, what made you write a song that was like related to Star Trek, and what were you thinking at that time? Well, see, uh, on the Spiz Oil tour, we, the Susie tour, supporting, but we supported Susie the Spiz Oil. We're in the car. Uh, I came across this in one of the towns. There was this uh, science fiction bookshop, and it had these photo novels. You know, I didn't have, no one had a, most people I knew didn't have a VHS recorder back then. So the only way uh, you, you you just saw the programs when they went out on air on, and so there's this book of photo novels. I wish I could put my hand on them, but they, they're in my studio. But the, um, uh, there were stills from, from the episodes with little speech bubbles saying, yeah, Beam Enterprise, yes, Captain here. And they got little speech bubbles. And when I was flicking through these books, I could hear the script because I'd watched the program so often. And I, I used to joke in the car that I, I'm, I am Captain Kirk. So that was a year before I wrote the song. So it was all, all, all sifting in there. So we did this rehearsal with, uh, uh, before we had a guitarist uh, uh, in, in Mark's keyboard player. Mark had, because we, we, he had uh, the, the most equipment, we used his house to rehearse in and Jim and me would go there. And uh, he had this song, this new song he wanted to play and I couldn't work out what it was about. And, but it had a catchy chorus. Uh, which one of the lines was, oh, but it's true. So after the rehearsal, we go to the pub, have a couple of beers, and then on the bus, because you know, we were bus, we were bus type pe- bus wankers then. And so, uh, so um, I, I had no pen and paper, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing more ver- words, oh, but it's true, as we, so the words were coming to me in my head, so I kept singing them in my head, in my head, praying for the bus to go quicker. And I got off the bus and I wrote down the first verse, second verse, and the third verse came to me. And then I went back to rehearsals the following week and said, look, hey, Mark, that song you played me, I can't work it out what you're on about, but I've got some new words. If you don't mind, I'll, uh, shall, we, shall we? So we did. And the boys just fell about laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing. They ever said. So we played it again. And then when we did it live for the first time, uh, people went completely bananas. We knew we got something special. Uh, yeah. You know, we, one, one gig we did, we did, uh, we, we run out of songs. So they said, we were about So we just did Captain Kirk eight times. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. What... <laughs> yeah, I, I DJed that song um, cause I, when I went to Japan because I did a little tour out there and like people absolutely loved that song in Japan oh, as right. well. Yeah, it's <laughs> really like, I don't know what it is because obviously I was playing the Clash and I was playing the Banshees and the Pistols and, and they were just kind of like, yeah, this is cool, but not really much. And then boom, where's Captain Kirk? The whole room just erupted. No conversations going on anymore. And everyone's just bouncing. And I was like, there's something like these Japanese people can't understand the words, but they just love the tune, you know? Well, I think if, I think if we could have got to Japan uh, either in the heyday or there was some kind of big revival not a decade ago or so, if we'd got over there then, we, 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 I would now be big, talking to you as someone who's big in Japan. <laughs> you are big in Japan, mate. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> you gotta, oh, okay. You got to make it over there. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, so, yeah, tell me a bit about your sci-fi influences, because obviously in the punk scene, uh, we've got the Rebellion <laughs> Festival. We've got so many people. Um, and there's just few that really stand out because they have just a striking image. And you have like blended your punk thing with the sci-fi thing. I mean, tell me about films, books, like things that you really recommend that just kicked off your sci-fi feelings. <laughs> well, uh, I was, uh, considering uh, my affection for uh, Bowie songs uh, and he, Aladdin Sane and Ziggy had lots of, you know, sparkly space invaders, you know, uh, yeah. stuff. Oh man, Moon Age Daydream, and then Aladdin Sane had Driving Saturday with all conjuring images of of, of future scapes. And of course, uh, well, when I was, uh, I think somewhere between school and college, I read 1984, which then was a science fiction, yeah, science fiction <laughs> novel. Now we're living it. <laughs> Not the Tory Manifesto. And um, <laughs> so I, I I got interested in all all that. And of course, I loved Star Trek when it was on telly before all this happened. Yeah, you know, Star Trek was the uh, I think we saw the first ones in black and white, but by the time we got a colour television, you know, Star Trek was actually designed by American TV companies. That's why the shirts are so vividly colourful. It was just to get a lot of colour in the telly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked because I, I, I loved the whole concept of the beaming and, and, and the, the warp speed stuff. And, and I, I, my favourite films are all, guess what? They're, Blade Runner's my all-time favourite film. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and The Matrix trilogy yeah. that, that 
that's those are great films and so it's, and I've, I've watched the Mar one red mars planet film yeah. last night i love all those but the same basically the same film rewritten in it where they have to rescue <laughs> a, a bloke trying to get off mars by <laughs> by a thing you know yeah. um uh, but I love them. I watch it. I, I, you know, I Doctor Who, of course, growing up even younger. The Daleks yeah. were fantastically petrifying. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, and the idea of time travel, it's all, it's all mixed in. You know, I could watch uh, Back to the Future. I don't like Back to the Future 2. I think it's a bit rubbish. But 1 and 3 are great. And I like, um, what's the other? Uh, any time travel films. Uh, there's loads of them. Uh, yeah. I, I just love them. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And... Um... Like, are there any artists that you recommend? I mean, I know like Grimes is a big artist at the moment, and she's always banging on about her sci-fi uh, influences in her interviews. Do you listen to anybody currently? Well, see, the, the one of the sources of getting new music was uh, the two programs, uh, Old Grey Whistle Test, and Top of the Pops. Where you know, even if it, you're something you hadn't heard, it was a new entry, and it was. But, but you don't get any of that anymore. I don't. I I'm, I'm, I make my own radio show on Resonance 104.4 FM. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and that's about coming out comes out on Wednesdays at 4:30 in London and online. It's, I'm on FM, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I, I don't. I do get to listen to some new music because usually people that uh, are in bands that send me stuff to play on the radio. So I don't listen to all that, all that chart stuff and young people and all that. No, I don't. I don't really hook up with the, uh, with the, the, the new genres. Uh, so it's, I don't want to sound like an old git, but I am <laughs> sounding like an old git. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, so your band has reformed since two thousand and seven. What boosted you to make that happen, and how has it been over the last like thirteen years? Well, the, that's what I was saying about the name changes when Spiz, 70, Spiz, Spiz Energy had seven guitarists and five drummers. So there's no actual real original lineup. The only original lineup you could actually suggest was the ones on Soldier Soldier, uh, where, where's Captain Kirk and the B sides, Virginia Plain and Amnesia. That is the band that is possibly would you could say, because they did gigs as well, uh, those members in those ba bands did. But there's no original lineup. Basically, whoever's worked with me is in the band. Yeah. It's, I've got, a, a, but 1996, I had a stable lineup, which lasted till uh, the bass player and the guitarist were committed, weren't being committed enough because their their work was more valuable to the gigs. So they said, get some other people in, and I did, and that's when Luca Comagini joined me, Ben Lawson and Phil Ross, and Jeff mm -hmm. had been me has been the longest with me since 1996, but he left at the beginning of lockdown because he he wanted just to stick to one band because he was in about three as well. Like everybody's in a couple of bands. Ben's in another band called the Fiascos. Luca's in the Darellas. It's only me and Phil are in Spiz Energy, but uh, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, a lot of bands in our stra stratosphere of where we are at are sometimes in more than one band. Uh, but that's the in session men they do that they 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 hop in and out of all sorts of bands they could be in a punk band one time then they could be supporting karen carpenter if she was alive you know what i mean there's yeah. there's professional <laughs> that, yeah. professional that they, they do what do both both any genre that they put put your notes in front of them and um as i say the uh the, the bands since 90 the october revolution of 1992 where my lineup until uh, alan galaxy has now replaced um uh jeff Alan came, he left Department S before he joined us. Um, so he was without a band, but in that, he, while he was in Department S, he was also in another band called Snide. So, but uh, nobody's in a band at the moment. Because <laughs> 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 the, the live work, re realistic, I'm not going to do those streaming stuff to, in you know, in a, in a room on your own with the, or w with the band and no, no audience. I mean, that's, and that's just you know people are going to be listening on all sorts of different quality of sound it's just not the same as this you, you know when you go to a gig you can hear that you can hear the bass player when he's thumping the bass so you, part of your clothes move and the drums you know <laughs> yeah. you don't get that. you can't get that and, you, and also you're sharing the experience you're not getting sharing when you're you're in your own bedroom and someone else is in new york in another bedroom then it's not the same thing so i can't do that i won't do that 
Yeah, no. But next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man, it's been an absolutely an absolute pleasure to talk to you today and I really enjoyed it. And we're going to look forward to playing your song in a minute. So I've just got one last question for you. I mean, you keep quite a strict DIY ethic. You're a visual artist. Um, we can see the Christmas trees in the background you've done there, as well as uh, a musical artist. I mean, um, what's good and what's a good and bad thing about being DIY and... Uh, <laughs> And do you have total control now in a way you didn't in the 80s? <laughs> well, uh, once, once we left A&M uh, and uh, went back to rough trade, we, it was back to back to normal. Where, where yeah. are we? I just do, I do all the designing of the record sleeves. And, and, there's that. and also, I didn't have a manager from then until this last year. Last yeah. year, I, I finally... I couldn't do it anymore. I was just, I just too, too much stress booking the hotels and the flights and all that. But now we're not doing any of that either. But at the time, I, I just, I was just being overwhelmed by the, the social media, all the, all the whole thing you have to do to get something, act, action happening. And talking to agents and, and, and club and promoters, I don't want to do that. I just want, I can't, I just be the singer who turns up and does a fabulous show. And, and, and then <laughs> yeah. I, I go back to the hotel and wait for the next day. But no, I, I just can't do all that. Di I did do, I did do all that DIY stuff. And I was happy to do that because, uh, you know, if the job's worth doing, do it yourself. I was that kind of guy, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, don't forget, yeah, The Shallow End, let me, that's a banging track there. So if anyone thinks, oh, no, it's a horrible Christmas song. It's not A, it's not a Christmas song. And B, that's a proper good <laughs> energy, Shallow End. Give that a plug and all. Excellent. Shallow End, you heard it here first. Get it get it on a record player. So where can people find your music? Um, what's your website address? Well, the record label have got a shop called holydotage.co.uk. Holy as in H-O-L-Y, dotage, D-O-T-A-G-E, dot co dot UK. Yeah. Uh, there's links, there's links there to, if you want to download it. So if you can get the vinyl there, you can download the uh, uh, Amazon, iTunes and uh, whatnot, um, Deezer, or there's a couple of other fancy digital platforms there. Uh, and of course, there's spizenergy.com for all your Christmas needs in the merch shop. I haven't got a lot of stuff, but I've got a few shirts, T-shirts, <laughs> various sizes. And of course, yeah. let's not forget, my uh, Spears Junior. Spears Junior. They're slightly more expensive than more other merchandise. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's very well behaved today. <laughs> but, uh, I yeah, think they'll sell well in Japan as well. You want to get a box of those, get over to Japan. <laughs> you he's sell got a out. Brother. <laughs> he's got a true brother, Goth Spears. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. They're a, terrible well, hand They're a real handful. In fact, they're two handfuls. Not many bands have their own puppets, so, you know, you got to think yeah. outside the box. I like it. <laughs> oh, and loads of badges as well. Uh, badges, yeah. Wicked. All right, guys, so check him out. Spiz Energy, he's been going 40 years. Where's Captain Kirk? To this new one about Denmark Street. Absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a great interview, and uh, and Merry Christmas, and thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care, man. Bye. Hey guys, DJ Ball of Frost here from Wait Out Radio, the one and only punk and reggae station broadcasting every week. Go to wayoutradio.com for more. So I just want to tell you guys about the brand new fan club we've just launched. It's absolutely amazing. You can choose from contributing £5, £10 or £20 per month to keep the station alive, pay our guests handsomely and keep music money in the musician's pocket and in the punk world and in the reggae world. So find out more about that at wayoutradio.com. Thank you very much.